nice. There's a few more of us. Um, just getting rid of the small person. Um, she's only just woken up lazy this morning. Um, right, so. Um, I think I'm going to crack on, even though there's only 20 of us, which I think is about a third of how many of us there were um, at the very beginning. Never mind. Um, so. There's my work pad. Hopefully you can see that now. Not Sarah Liz's ceiling, which is great. Okay, so um, it's week eight of um, Introduction to Statistics again. Um, and it's also 9 a.m. So thank you all very much for getting here, especially if you're in the UK. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to do some of the questions together as we have done in previous weeks. The questions I've picked up to get picked out to give a go are number two, four and six. And hopefully we can get through those in 45 minutes. Um, we're, we're just going to do them exactly like we've done them before. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit and give you some hints and then give you a chance to either check your solution. Um, at, in light of those hints or give working on the exercise a go if you've not had a chance. Um, some of the, the gaps I'm going to leave are possibly going to be a little bit on the short side if you've not had the chance to look at the exercise sheet in advance and that's totally okay. Um, you know to just try and listen along and make sure that you can follow um, and yeah if you're doing things for the first time you know maybe it is going to be a bit tricky to keep up but it should be fine. So. The first question I wanted to look at was number two. So exercise sheet eight, question number two. Um, and in this question, um, what we were given is we were told that we've got um, two independent samples um, um, of sizes N1 and N2. And we, we don't actually have the values in those samples, but we really do have the sample means. So we've got um, uh, X bar one, which is the mean from a sample of size of size N1 and X bar two. And that's similar, that's uh, the mean um, of, a of a sample of size N2. And both of them are taking values um, from a distribution which is normal with mean mu and um, variance sigma, sigma squared. So what we've been told is that um, we know what sigma squared is and we'd like to try and come up with an estimate for what um, mu is. So. And the question proposes, oh, that's really out of focus. That's a little bit better. It's got a little bit of glare on, but that's because it's very bright in in my kitchen today. Um, so just shout if if it's difficult for you to follow what's um, what's going on on there. Let's see if I turn that off. It's going to improve a little bit. No, not really. That's better. There we go. Okay, 
So um, we don't know what mu is, and we've been given in the question that they want us to take an estimator um, for mu of the form mu hat um, is equal to um, alpha times x1 bar plus 1 minus alpha uh, x2 bar uh, for some alpha. Um, we don't know what which the best alpha to take is. We just know that it's in the in the range zero to one. Um, and the question asked us, first of all, um, to show that the bias is equal to zero. Um, and then secondly, to um, find out um, which value of alpha will minimize the variance. Um, so with the bias, um, what we need to do is we just need to remember what the formula is for the bias, which is it's the expectation of our estimator um, minus the, the actual mean and what's that going to look like. Um, so in order to do this, what I would suggest we need to do is we need to substitute the formula for the estimator into here. So into the expectation, we need to find the expectation of this guy. Um, and then we need to see whether it's different from mu or not. Um, so let's do that together. Now, I think the key thing here is that in order to evaluate this expectation here, we're going to need to know what's the expectation of the sample mean uh, for the first sample and for the second sample. So this information here that we've been given, um, this should start us off quite nicely. So because we know um, that x bar is uh, the mean of a sample of size n1 and that each of the little individual x that go into uh, x bar 1 is normally distributed um, in this way, um, what I'm going to know, uh, what I can deduce is that x bar 1 is normally distributed with parameters mu and sigma squared divided by n1. And similarly, um, similarly with x2, x2 bar is normally distributed with parameters mu and sigma squared divided by n2. Okay, so that should be, um, so remembering uh, these properties of the sample mean should be enough to be able to get us to be able to calculate this. Now, the first thing is, is that we've got the sum of two random variables and the expectation of the sum is the sum of an expectation. And the next thing we've got is we've got some constants in there and we know we can take the constant terms outside of the expectations as well. And that's going to leave us with the expectation of x1 and the expectation of x uh, bar 2. And we know what those are as well. So these are going to be um, mu in both cases. So I'm going to have um, alpha mu plus 1 minus alpha mu and minus mu. And hopefully we can immediately see that those are going to cancel out because um, I've got this one cancelling with this one, this one, this one. So that's shown that the bias is zero, which is what we wanted. Now, the second part here, um, we wanted a similar, we, we first of all, we need a similar expression for the variance of, of, uh, of the estimator. one, the variance of mu hat, um, and some similar rules are going to apply. So you're going to want to um, insert the form of mu hat that we've been given, and then you want to use your rules about um, how the variance works and the distributions of um, x1 and x2, it's x bar 1 and x bar 2, um, in order to expand that out. Um, so I'm just going to give you um, a couple of minutes um, just to write down um, a formula or work out a formula for uh, the variance of mu hat. Um, and then we'll have a chat about what we need to do next. Uh, as always, um, if anybody's got any questions um, uh, and would like um, 
to, to mention them in the in the chat um, or chat to each other, please do that. Um, anything goes really, I don't really mind what comes up in the chat. Doesn't really even have to be about statistics if, it does, if you don't want it to. Um, probably best it is, but yeah. Okay, so the expression that I got for uh, the variance of mu hat is this guy here, um, and we can see the, the variance of um, x bar 1 there, and the variance of x bar 2, and then our constants actually have a squared term on, and the reason for that is that when we're trying to take a constant outside of a variance, we need to square it. Um, which we've run into a number of times so far in this course. So if we wanted to try and find a minimum point of, of this guy, um, we're going to need to try, um, try and find a point where the derivative is zero. So I think the first thing we could try and do um, is we could try differentiating this thing by alpha, and setting that to zero and seeing what kind of point we find within the range zero to one. So. Okay, so maybe you can um, immediately see what to do with that. So we've got an alpha squared in this first term. So we're going to have two alpha and then the, the same constant, so sigma squared divided by n1. Um, and I'll let you have a, have a go at doing that second term just for, just for a moment. So yeah, it's going to work pretty kind of similarly. Um, we're going to have um, two alpha minus two sigma squared n two. Okay, and we know that all that, that all of this is equal to zero, uh, um, at a minimum, maximum, or a saddle point. Um, so we want to try and solve this for alpha. So solving for alpha. Well, I guess the first thing I'd quite like to do is I'd quite like to maybe get rid of the n1 and the n2 off the bottom of um, those fractions, um, just so that I could rearrange a little bit more easily. And I've got some things that occur everywhere, so I can maybe get rid of the two for, from everywhere, and I can get rid of the sigma. So let's try that. And then rearranging this. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply everything by n1 and then everything by n2. Okay. 
And then I've got this N1 that I can move to the other side. And then hopefully from there, we can immediately see that, uh, that there's going to be some kind of point of inflection um, at the point alpha mentioned in the question. Now, typically what you need to do at this point is you need to check the second order condition in order to see whether it's a minimum, a maximum or a saddle point. Um, so your second order condition is you just need to differentiate the expression again uh, and see whether it's positive or negative um, or otherwise. So, um, so next we need to check um, second derivative of the variance of nu hat um, with respect to alpha. Um, and again, I'm just going to give you a few minutes um, just to maybe do that if you've not done it so far or check your working and just check that you're happy with what's going on there and uh, whether or not you can show that that's a minimum. So hopefully you can find this guy just by looking at this one and noting where the alphas are. So there's no alpha in this final term here. So we can neglect that. And then we've got two alpha, um, two alpha. So we know that uh, the second order derivative is going to be a constant. Um, and we've got two. And then sigma squared divided by n1 from this one. That's very similar here, 2 sigma squared divided by n2 here. All right, and all of this is bigger than zero. So we know it's bigger than zero because n1 and n2 are our sample sizes, so they're positive. Um, and sigma's been squared, sigma's a real number. So um, it's, it's also, when you square it, it's going to be positive as well. Um, so great. Um, so because the second order derivative is bigger than zero, we know that it's definitely a minimum. Okay, so then we're in that position of like, we're done um, with question two. Question four. So question four um, is about like uh, is about a likelihood function. We were given five points of a random sample, and we know that they've been taken from a binomial distribution. N is, N is equal to three, and we don't know what the probability of a success is. So for each of these little xi's that's a member of that sample, they can take any value between zero and three. So each of the little xi's is going to be in zero, one, two, three. Um, for each x, for each x, for each i, sorry, for each i. Um, and we, we really don't 
um, have any idea what, what pins should be. Well, we've been given some, some possible options, but the first thing we've been asked is to write down the likelihood function. Okay. And how um, LP is made up is it's um, the product um, of the probability uh, that a random variable from this distribution takes the value that we can see in the sample. Um, so I'm going to have a product from i is equal to 1 to 5 because we've been given five little elements in our sample here. Um, and then um, 3, choose x1, xi3, pxi, 1 minus p, um, 3 minus xi. So this expression here um, is the probability that um, x equals x capital i'm going to i'm going to call it capital x um, so um, a random variable which is distributed in this way takes the value x i okay and um, you could leave it there i mean there's no harm in just leaving it at that point uh, that's the definition of what uh, the likelihood function is. Um, but in this case, um, we, we can simplify it a little bit. Um, and we can simplify it um, because of um, how the, the products of powers work. So um, what I'm going to have is um, I'm going to be able to take out some p, um, take out some factors of, of p. Um, now, um, what this term is going to have is it's going to have um, 3 choose x1 and px1 1 minus p 3 minus x1 etc um, and then the second term is going to look very similar but with x2 And then some extra terms on there as well. I'm not, I'm not going to write out all of them. So what I can do is I can then I can group together the, the, the like terms. So I've got lots of p's in there with different powers. So you can see I've got a p x1 here and a p x2 here. So um, let's pull those all together. Okay, lovely. All of my P's together. Um, and then I'm also going to have some 1 minus P's as well. So some more of those. And then finally, um, I'm going to have 3 choose x1, 3 x2, 3 choose etc. on the end of there as well. Now, again, this is moderately straightforward to simplify because I've got um, all of all p's here and different powers. I can just add up all what those different powers are. So I'm going to have p raised to the power of the sum of the xi. And then what's going to happen with this one here? I'm going to have 1 minus p. Um, right, so I'm going to have lots of constants, aren't I? Because I'm going to have 3 and 3 here. So I'm going to go for 15 minus the sum. of the xi's and hopefully you can see why that would be the case because I've got five lots of three going in there so 15 
and then each of them's got subtracted off one of the x i so that's going to look like that and then i'm also going to have a term which i can't really simplify so i'm just going to write it as a product still um, i is equal to one to five um, of these three choose x i okay so i think um kind of this one is good. You can just work with this one. It's not a big deal. Um, but then if you want to try and get rid of um, the product because it's easier to work with sums than products, in this particular example, you can because things are being raised to the power of, of xi. And that will help us switch between the two. So with our likelihood function in mind, that's going to make it possible for us to do the second part of this question. So. do the second part we were get actually given um, some values for, for the xi's so we were told that these are going to be equal to one three two two three okay and we were given some possible candidate um, p's as well and we were told that the possible piece is 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, and 0 0.8. So, what we'd like to do, or our ultimate goal, is to calculate the likelihood function at p for each of these p's, and then we'll pick which one's biggest. Um, so to help us along those kind of routes, if we're looking at um, the equation for P that we were given, or rather that we derived here, what we can see is in there is we can see that we've got uh, the sum of the XI's and then we've got these three choose XI's. So if for each of the actual values of, of X1, X2, X3, etc., that we've been given, if we find out what the sum is, and then what three choose xi is, these are going to be helpful for the formula. So we've, I've just written out the formula again, just so that we don't have to keep switching pages. Um, and I'll show you maybe one of those. So um, the sum over all of the x i's, I've got 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus these ones. So I can see immediately that that's going to be 11. OK, now what about these terms here? So I've got. Um, in this product, um, 3 choose 1, um, 3 choose 3, or 3 choose 2, 3, 2, and 3, 3. So, again, I would like, you know, you guys to maybe try a little bit here, but definitely with 3 choose 3, there's only one way of doing that. So this one's going to be equal to 1. And this one's going to be equal to one. And I think with three choose one, so I've got a sample size of, of three, I'm picking only one element. There's going to be three ways of doing that. Okay, so that's sort of getting me a little bit closer. Um, and then I don't, no, I'm not going to derive entirely the value of LP for 0 0.5 for you. I'll let you give all four of them a little bit of a go. I think the first thing you need to do is decide what values of the these are so that you know what your con this, this is going to end up being a constant term. We're going to have p to the that, uh, power of 11, 1 minus p to the value uh, power of 15 minus 11, so uh, to the power of 4. Um, and then you're just going to need to plug in your values of p. So why don't we have um five minutes or so for you to just verify your answers for that or give it a go if you've not had a chance 
um, and then we'll come back and um, have a little yeah when you've decided which which one's the biggest um, so um, when you found the value, values of LP the biggest one is the one that's most indicative that P should take that value so if you if you found the biggest one within those five minutes post it via direct message to me um, you might want to post it in the general chat as well and you know let other people decide um, vote on whether you're right or not that would be a very bold move um, but you know crack on um, bust your calculator out if needed I, well I think you're definitely going to need to bust your calculator out and um, let me know which value of P you think, um, uh, for which value of P LP is biggest because um, that's going to be the answer um, and in five minutes we'll just crack on with um, at least the first part of question six. Okay, so I've got one person who's told me the right answer. So well done, that person. Um, they were very quick, so I suspect that they're probably uh, taking a look at this exercise in advance. Um, would anybody else like to pitch in the, the possibility?
Okay, so what may speed you up or push you in the right direction is the three choose two and three choose two are also three because there's one way of missing one out from a sample of three. So we've, the constant here is going to be 27. And then with this in mind, so LP is then going to be 27 times P to the power of 11, one minus P to the power of four. Um, and then you can stick in these values of P and you will find that this one is the biggest. So zero, the value of um, LP at, zero, at P is equal to 0 0.7 is the biggest, which implies that of those values of P, um, you know, we've got more evidence that P is equal to 0 0.7 than any of the other values. Um, so our maximum likelihood um, estimates uh, is going to be um, that P is equal to 0 0.7. Right. So question six. Um, I would have liked to have given you a chance to uh, do the second part of this one, but we will see. Um, we've been given sigma as 0 0.8 from the question. We were given a sample of size n is equal to 10, and the values were given in the question. Um, and what we were asked for is a 95% confidence interval for the mean. So we want to try and um, find from the um, sample mean um, a, a range in which we're, 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 we've got 95% like chance that um, the actual um, mean is in, um, uh, in that range. And um, how we go about doing this um, is we need to try and find, um, yeah, we just basically need to try and find the ends of, the, uh, of that range. So we, um, the endpoints of this range um, are gonna have the values. Um, well, we're gonna, we want the sample mean to be slap bang in the middle. So that's the sample mean, we want that to be in the middle. And then we want plus or minus, um, and then for a 95% um, uh, confidence interval, we want to be looking at um, a certain um, constant times by uh, the variance of, uh, of the sample. Let's say so standard deviation of the sample. So um, what we're going to have is we're going to have Z, and this is suff um, the suffix on this is one minus alpha divided by two. Um, and here, the little alpha, needs to be um, what's left over from this 95%. So it's going to be alpha is equal to 0 0.05. Okay. Um, and then we've got sigma divided by sigma divided by the square root of n. So, so these are going to be the, the two extremes um, of the confidence interval. And um, what exactly is this little z thing here? So um, Z minus one over alpha. Uh, uh, so Z um, at one minus alpha divided by two um, solves um, try um, Z divided by two equals um, one minus alpha over two. So the Z that we're looking for um, is the value such that when I put it into the CDF of the normal distribution with parameters zero and one, I get out um, the same probability. So it's the uh, position of the um, appropriate quartile in this particular case. Now for this one, I've been give, I'm looking for a 95th percentile. So I wanna try and exclude two and a half percent on each side, which is why I've got the divide by two here is because I don't want all of the 5% on one side because that would mean that um, the amount of the distribution between um, the two extremes is gonna be um, not 95%. So, um, so 
So I want to put X bar in the middle. And then based on this, I'm going to have 2.5% chance of being here. And if that's the case, then the value here is Z of 0 0.975 um, and sigma divided by square root of n, which in our case uh, is determined by these. Okay. So the, the really the only difficult thing here is to try and solve this thing. So Okay, and you can just look that up in uh, in the table for the normal distribution, and um, you should be able to find that um, uh, Z zero point nine seven five um, is equal to one point nine six. So now we've got everything I need uh, to explicitly calculate a number for each of these because. I can find the sample mean of those 10 points that I was given in the question. I know that n is equal to 10, so we've got square root um, of 10 here. I know what sigma is, 0 0.8. And I've also been able to find uh, what my constant z is as well. So putting all of that together, um, Eleven point four four eight minus one point nine six times zero point eight divided by square root of ten, and then for the upper bound, I just need to change the sign here. So I'm going to have eleven point four eight plus one point nine six times zero point eight divided by square root of ten. So I realise that I'm bang out of time now, and I can't really let let you have the opportunity to go away and try the 90th um, but you know just as a final kind of question just think about what if anything in this in this interval here you would need to change to change it from a 95th to a, a 99th um, confidence interval um, and how you'd go about doing that so I think it's really very minimal calculation that you need to do you just need to be able to recognize which bit of this is determined by the size of the confidence interval, which of it is determined by the data, and then have a think about how you, you would switch that out. Um, so I'm going to leave that open for you. You can hang around and you can give that a go. I suspect it'd probably take you probably like one or two minutes to have a think about what you need to change there. So somebody's asking me, where does the 11.48 come from? And that's a really good question. So if you look at the question, um, and there's the 10 data points in the question, um, and you add them up and divide by 10, you get 11.48. So that's um, you know the mean of the actual data that you've been given in the question. And I realized that number just kind of came out of magic a little bit. So thanks for that question. So what I guess that's given us a bit of a hint that it's not going to be the 11.48 that we're going to be changing in that confidence interval to switch it from 95 to 99% confidence interval. So have a little think about what you need to change. Um, you can hang around and think about that if you need to, um, or you can leave and I will see you in two more weeks for the final uh, tutorial that I'm taking um, on intro to stats. Um, I'm, I'm just going to hang around until 10 to answer any questions that you've got there. So that I've got a question, when is the final exam? And I'm not the best person to be asking that because the person who is um, uh, administering the course is Sarah Lees. Hopefully Sarah Lees is here and he can tell you when the final exam is.
thank you. Um, uh, Yang Xin Zhang, when the final exam is, sorry, or um, do you not know yet? Uh, don't know yet. I think it's sometimes in May. Yeah, okay, okay. Um, yeah, so the exam period starts from the 17th of May, um, runs at least yeah. four weeks, and I don't know when the maths exams are in that in that period, whether you get early exams or late exams typically in maths. Yeah. Yeah. We'll just have yeah. to wait and see, won't we? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for letting me use your channel, Sarah Lee, and I'll see yeah, my you. Pleasure. Thank you for your time. And no worries. See you soon. Bye bye. Yeah, bye. Hello guys, you okay? Hope you got a hope you got had a good Easter break.
hundred grand. Oh, I was.
Good morning, guys, or good afternoon. Hope all of you are well. Um, all right, guys. Um, so this is a tutorial session for week eight. Um, today I'm going to go through uh, the sheet number eight. So let me show you if you haven't seen it before. Um, if you go to week eight, this is the this is the tutorial sheet for today, right? There are there are seven questions. I will try to do as many as I can. Okay, guys, um, and as usual, uh, when, uh, any question, any question you guys have, please feel free to write to me using using the chat room. Okay. Okay. Hope you guys had a good good Easter break. Good to see you back uh, back here. Okay. So let's start with um, let's start with the last question first, right? So let me change the camera just a minute. Um, so I, I will start with question seven and work backwards, right? So question seven uh, says the following, that is, uh, you have an um, uh, engineering, engineering firm that, that makes a component, right? And the, that component has a, a lifetime with the standard deviation of 3.4, right? And uh, and it also and you're taking a sample of oh, nine okay. components, and their average lifetime is 100.8, okay? And the question is to find the 95% and 98% confidence intervals for the mean lifetime. Right now, if you if you listen to the if you, if you guys if you guys listen to the uh, the review session yesterday, right? You would have noticed that I gave you several formula for confidence intervals. The one you need to use in this for this question is the following. This, this is the formula that you need to use for this question because we are assuming that the, we are, the, the question says explicitly that the population standard deviation is, is known and is equal to 3.4. So this is, the, this is the formula that we will, we will use for this question, all right? Now, all right, the sigma is given to us as 3.4. Our n, n is the sample size, is given to us as nine. And x bar, x bar is the sample mean and is given to us as equal to 100.8. All right, so all we have to do is just work this out. Now we want the 95 and the 98%. So, so let's consider the 95 first. So your 100 times one minus alpha is 95, all right? So, so your alpha, so your alpha, uh, your one minus alpha, I mean, is gonna be 0 0.95 and your alpha will be 0 0.05, okay? All right, so, so your Z, one minus alpha by two, is gonna be Z 0 0.975. Now, if you read this off the table, I, I showed you in the video that how to read this, right, in the, from the normal table. If you haven't seen the video, please do so. Uh, this will be equal to 1.96, right? So now, if you put all these numbers into this formula, she put all these numbers into this formula, you will get X bar, which is 100.8. Go ahead. 
plus or minus 1.96 multiplied by 3.4 divided by square root of nine. Okay, guys. And if you, if you work this out using a calculator, the lower limit of the confidence interval will be this, and the upper limit is this. So this is the 95% confidence interval for the mean lifetime okay, of the component. All right, guys, any questions so far? Please, please let me know. So now part two, part two of the same question is asking you to find the 98% confidence interval. So 100 times one minus alpha is, is 98 which implies that one minus alpha is 0 0.98, okay? And this implies that alpha is 0 0.02. And this implies that uh, Z one minus alpha by two is Z 0 0.99. And once again, if you read this off the table, the normal table, I explained how to do that in the video, you will get this to be 2.326, right? Now, once again, if you use the, the formula at the very top of this page, right? If you use the formula, you get 100.8 plus or minus 2.326 times 3.4 divided by the square root of nine, All right? And this, if you simplify this, is gonna be 98.16 comma 103.44. So this is the 98% confidence interval for the mean lifetime, okay? Are you guys okay with this? Uh, please. Hello guys, talk to me. Are you, are you okay with this question? Yeah. All of you okay? Is it just your crowd? All of you guys okay? Okay, thank you guys. Okay. All right, so I'm done with question, question seven. So I've just finished question seven if you're joining me. So the next thing I'm gonna look at is question six. Question six is about a chemical concentration in a fish caught in Lake, Lake Michigan. And you are told that the standard deviation is 0 0.8 per million. And the sample size is 10. And these are the data values for the 10 fish that are caught. Um, and the question is to find the 95 and the 99% confidence interval. Now, the first thing you should figure out is which formula to use. Remember, in the review video I did, I gave you four different formulas depending for four different situations, right? In this case, once again, the standard deviation is given to you as 0 0.8. Okay, the standard deviation is given to you. So the formula that you need to use is the following. It's the same as the previous. This is the formula that you need to use to do question six, right? Okay, guys, so your sigma is 0 0.8, your n is 10, and your x bar, x bar is the sample mean. In other words, in this case, it's the mean of these 10 different numbers. So what you need to do is to, is to take the sum of these 10 numbers and divide by 10. And if you do that, you will get 11.48, 11 11 okay? So this is the, the mean, right? Okay, now let's consider the 95% confidence interval. So 100 times one minus alpha is, is 95, which implies that one minus alpha is 0 0.95. 
all right and and this implies that alpha is 0 0.05 so z 1 minus alpha by 2 will be z 0 0.975 yeah and if you read this off the table this will be 1.96 okay now using this formula x bar is 11.48 plus or minus 1.96 times 0 0.8 divided by the square root of 10. All right, and if you work this out using a calculator, you will get the lower limit to be 10.99 and the upper limit to be 11.98. Okay, so this is the 95% confidence interval for the mean concentration. Okay, are you guys okay with this? Hello guys, talk to me. Are you okay? Any questions on this so far? Okay, thank you. All right, the next part is to is to compute the 99% the 90, confidence interval. Okay, so we said 100 times 1 minus alpha to be equal to 99, right? So your, alpha, so your 1 minus alpha is 0 0.99 and your alpha is 0 0.01 and your z um, this guy is going to be 0 0.995 and if you read this off the table you will get to be 2.576 all right so once again using the formula this formula here excuse me excuse, using this formula right you will get the answer to be 11.48, which is the sample mean, plus or minus 2.576 multiplied by 0 0.8 divided by the square root of 10, right? So this, if you work this out, it will be 10.83 is the lower limit and 12.13 is the upper limit. So this is the this is the 99th percent confidence interval for the mean concentration. Okay, guys, are you okay so far? I mean, any questions on question six? So I just finished, I just finished doing question number six. Are you okay with this? Hello guys, talk to me, please. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you guys. So the next question I'm gonna look at, the, the next question I'm gonna look at is question five. Question five is on maximum likelihood estimation. So you have a random sample from a geometric distribution with unknown parameter P. The first step is to write down the likelihood and the log likelihood. And the second step is to find the maximum likelihood estimator for P, right? Um, I think I did this question earlier, but anyway, I will do it again. I mean, there's no harm doing it again. So this is question five. All right, remember the first thing you must do is to, the first step is to write down, is to write down the likelihood function. Remember, the likelihood function is the product of the density function. In this case, the probability mass function, which is P times one minus P to the power XI minus one. Yeah, this, this is the probability mass function of the geometric distribution, if you, if you recall, right? Okay, now this you can write as
can write like this, yeah? Okay, now the product of P, I from one to N is P power N. And the product of this, I from one to N is Okay, like this, yeah. Now this can be simplified further. Now, if you take the summation within the brackets, open brackets, you will get the sum of sum of xi minus the sum of one. The sum of one is n, okay? So this is the likelihood function of p right the next step is to take the log of the likelihood so the log of this so the log, if you take the log you get n times log of p right plus Right, this is the log of the likelihood. Okay, are you guys okay? I mean, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat room. Okay. All right, so that's the part one. Part two is to is to find the MLE. Remember to find the MLE, the first thing you should do is to is to take the derivative with respect to P. So the derivative of this with respect to P is N divided by P minus okay so this is the derivative now we need to solve this is we need to set this to zero and solve for p so that's what i'm going to do now so this becomes n by n divided by p equal to okay equal to this here now you should you should do cross multiplication you get n minus n p equal to p times Okay, you guys okay so far? Now these two guys cancel out. So the solution for P, let me call it P hat. The solution for P is N divided by the sum of XI. All right, which you can write as one, one divided. Are you guys okay? All right, so this is the solution for p hat. Now, to make sure that this is a maximum likelihood estimator, you need to take the second order derivative. All right, I'm going to do it on a new page. So let me show you the the second order derivative of the log likelihood with respect to p. All right, is the first order derivative of this with respect to p. So this is going to be minus n over p squared minus all right this is what you get right now this is less than zero the reason that this is less than zero because this term is clearly negative. And this term, this guy here, this guy here is non-negative because I will explain why. Remember for the, for the geometric distribution, for the geometric distribution, Xi is a number that must be greater than or equal to one for every I. 
by definition, right? Which implies that the sum of xi, if you take the sum of xi must be greater than or equal to the sum, sum of one, right? Okay. And this implies that, that the sum of xi Yeah, sum of xi is greater than or equal to sum of one is n. All right, and this implies that the sum of xi minus n must be greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so in other words, this guy here is greater than or equal to zero. And hence, because this is a negative number and this is not negative, the whole thing must be less than zero. So hence we have shown, hence we have shown that all right. Are you guys okay? Hello guys. Any are you okay with this question? The solution. Everybody okay? Oh, okay, good guys. Thank you. Thank you guys. It's great to see you. Um, all right, the next question I'm gonna do, the next question I'm gonna do is question four. So let's, let me show you. Um, so I, I just finished doing question five. So I just finished this. Now question four, Question four is this one, right? So here you have a random sample of size five from a binomial distribution with parameters three and P. The first part is to write down the likelihood for P. So let me do that. So this is question number four. So, so we have uh, five, five data points. We have five data points coming from a binomial distribution with parameters three and P. Okay, right. Now I'm going to I'm going to show you how to simplify this, all right? There are three different terms, so you have basically three different products. Okay. All right, guys. Okay, now the, the first product, you can't simplify it. So you have to just write it like this. All right, the second product, the second product, you can simplify it as, as this. Yeah, and the third product, you can simplify it as as this, yeah. All right, and finally,
Now, if you take the product, if you take, sorry, if you take the sum inside the, the brackets, right, you will get the following. The sum of three is 15 minus the sum of xi, i from one to one to five. All right, so this is the this is the, the simplified form of the likelihood function. This is clear to all of you guys or not? I hope it is clear. If it's not, please let me know. I will try to explain again. Okay, if it's not clear, let me know. Okay, and uh, all right, the next thing I'm gonna show you, so that's the first part of question four. The, the second part of question four is to let me show you. This is part two. Part two of question four. It, it given you the values for the for the x's one three two two three, and it's asking you to compute the maximum likelihood estimator out of this. All right. So let me show you. So what you are given. What you are given is the following, guys. You are told that x one is equal to one, x two is equal to three x3 uh, is equal to 2, x4 is equal to 2, x5 is equal to 3, All right? Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sub this into this formula and simplify it, right? Um, now, you should take the sum of these five numbers, right, you get this to be equal to 11, right? Okay, so this guy here, you can simplify to the following, right? It becomes uh, three choose one, three choose three, three choose two, three choose two, three choose three, yeah. And then P raised to the power sum of Xi, which is 11 and one minus P raised to the power 15 minus 11. Okay. Now, if you have a calculator, you can simplify this to 27 times P power 11, one minus P power four. All right, so this is the, 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 the simplified form of the likelihood for, for these values of the x's, right? All right, the next thing the question is asking you is, the question tells you that the, diff, the values that P can take are one of these, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, or 0 0.8, right? Okay. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna compute this, this function here at each of these values. So when P is 0 0.5, you should do the calculations in a calculator, or you will see this. This is what you will get when P is equal to 0 0.5. When P is 0 0.6, it is 2.51. When P is 0 0.7, it will be 4.32. And when P is 0 0.8, it is 3.71. Okay. Now, now what we remember the, the maximum likelihood estimator is the is the parameter value for which the likelihood is the largest. Now, which of these is the largest? Tell me, guys. Which which of these is the largest? And which which one is the? This one is the largest. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So. So. This. So the MLE of P is 0 0.7. All right, guys. So 
as I said, I mean, the maximum likelihood estimate uh, is the parameter value for which the likelihood is the greatest or the largest, right? Okay, guys, any questions? So this is, I just finished doing question four. Are you, are you guys okay with that or no? Hello guys, talk to me. Okay, thank you, Matthew. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, all right, so let me go back to the sheet. So I just finished doing question four. So let's go to question three now. In question three, you have a random sample from this density function. The first part is to show that X bar is a biased estimate of delta. Now, remember, uh, I mean, I did uh, about 20 questions on this, so you should know, you should know how to do this kind of questions. I mean, uh, All right, so basically you need to, so this is question number three. Uh, this is the density function we're given and we're, uh, the proposed estimate, uh, so this, you have X bar as, as an estimate, uh, as an estimator of delta, right? Okay, now we want to find the bias we need to show that this this um, bias is not equal to zero. I mean, if the bias is not equal to zero, that means it's a biased, it's a biased estimator, right? Okay, now remember the bias is defined as, this is the definition of bias. I gave this to you some time ago, right? So this is the expectation of Right. Now take the expectation inside, you get one over N times the sum of the expectation of XI minus delta, right? Now to find the expectation of XI, you need to just do the integration. You are given the density function, right? So you just need to do the integration. So this will be one over N times the sum from delta to infinity of E minus X plus delta DX minus delta, right? Okay, delta is a constant, so you can pull it outside. So this becomes E power delta Okay. Ah, oh, sorry, I put an X, there's, there should be an X here, sorry. Okay, all right, now, how do you do this integration, guys? I mean, there, there are several ways you can do this integration. One way, one way to do this integration is use integration by parts. I'm sure you've done this. I'm sure you know integration by parts, don't you? Yeah, so. Now, if you do integration by parts, um, this is what you will get. All right, this is what you will get, all right? This is a minus here, guys, okay? All right, I mean, I'm sure, I hope you guys remember integration by parts. If you don't, please, please look back in your calculus notes. I'm sure all of you do remember, right? 
Um, now the limit at infinity is zero. The limit at at a delta is is this, right? Okay, and the integral of this guy is not difficult. It is simply minus e of minus x. Uh, take the limit from delta to infinity. All right, okay. Uh, so you get e power delta divided by n times the sum i from one to n The, the limit at infinity is zero and the limit at delta is, is this, right? Okay, all right. So now if you multiply, you see there's a e to the power delta outside. So if you multiply, you should bring that inside the brackets and multiply, this is what you will get, you will get one over n times the sum of delta plus one. Okay. All right, guys, are you, are you with me so far? Let me know if you're not. Okay, so this is gonna be one over n. Now this is a constant. So the so sum of a constant is simply n times the constant. Okay, so this is gonna be delta plus one minus delta, which is equal to one and which is not equal to zero. So we have shown, so what we have shown guys is that that X bar is a biased estimator. Did, 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 you, did you follow what I've done here, guys? I know it, it looks kind of lengthy, but it's, it's basic calculus, guys. It's not difficult. Are you, are you okay with this? Hello, guys. Are you sure? Okay. How did you get delta plus one in the summation? Yeah, that's because, um, Harry, what I've done here is is to multiply everything inside the square bracket inside the curly brackets by by this term here. So if you bring this, if you bring this inside here, Harry, yeah, you get delta times this times this, which is delta plus zero. Then you have minus minus, which is plus, and this multiplied by this is is simply one, right? Do you see that or not? Okay, so that's how you get delta plus one here. Okay, good. All right, so that's the first part. That's only the first part of question question three. Uh, the second part, the second part of question three, so this is part two, is to derive, okay, we have already found the bias, right? We have already found the bias of X bar to be equal to one and discuss what happens to its value as n goes to infinity. Now you take the limit of this, you should take the limit of this as n goes to infinity, right? That will still be one because one is a constant, right? One is a constant. So the limit as n tends to infinity will still be one. Okay, so it's a trivial. All right, so now part three. Let's go to question three, part three now. Can you propose an alternative unbiased estimate of delta? Right, now to answer this, let's go back to part one. You should go back to part one. You see, we got the bias, the bias of the we got the bias of x bar to be equal to one, right? Now for an estimator to be unbiased, this must be zero, 
All right, so one way you can make this zero is to take away one from, from X bar. So that's what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna define, I'm gonna define a new estimator. Define a new estimator as let's call this delta hat, right? And let's call this x bar take away one, right? All right, then then the bias of delta hat, right? Okay, it's gonna be the expectation of delta hat minus delta, which is the expectation of x bar minus one minus delta. And this is the expectation of x bar minus one minus delta. And we know from the first part, we know from part one that the expectation of x bar is delta plus one. All right, so this is this is zero. So we have shown, so we have shown that the new estimator is unbiased. Remember, uh, estimator is unbiased if the bias is zero, right? It's unbiased for for delta. All right. So this completes this completes question number three. Are you guys okay with this or no? Any questions on question three, guys, please let me know. Don't be shy. I'm here to help you 24 seven. Anything I can do, let me know, All right? All right, thank you guys. So let's, so we are done with question three. The next question I'm gonna do is question two. So here we have uh, two sample means corresponding to sample sizes of N1 and N2 from this distribution. And uh, there are two parts. The first part is to show that this is a, has bias equal to zero as an estimator for mu, right? Okay, let's see how we can do this. Um, excuse me, just a minute. Um, This is question number two. So you have uh, x bar one. X bar one is the is the sample mean of size n one from a normal distribution. Now, if you look at the video on the normal distribution I did earlier, you will see you will see that x bar. This is a property I mentioned in the video on normal. So x bar one must have this distribution. And similarly, x bar two must have, must have this distribution. Okay. Now, what we are given is the following estimator. We are given this estimator and we need to show that the bias of this estimator is zero. So that's what I'm gonna do now. So I'm gonna look at the bias of mu hat, right? which is the expectation of mu hat minus mu, right? Okay, guys. And which is the expectation of A times minus mu, right? Now, if you take the expectation inside, guys, you will get a times the expectation of x bar one plus one minus a times the expectation of x bar two. Okay. Now we know that x bar one has this distribution, so so the expected value is mu, and we know that x bar two has this distribution, so the expected value is also mu. All right, and and this simplifies to zero, right? And hence we have shown that mu hat 
is unbiased for for me all right guys are you okay with this all right so that's the first part of question number two the second part of question number two is to find the variance to find the variance of the estimator so so we are looking for the variance of mu hat right, which is the variance of a times x bar one plus one minus a times x bar two. Now if you take the variance inside, it becomes a squared times the variance of, of this plus one minus a squared times the variance of, of this, right? Remember, a is a constant. So when you, when you take the variance inside, in, sorry, inside, you need to square the constant. So a becomes a squared, and one minus a becomes one minus a squared. Right? Now we know from from this property here that the variance of x bar one is is this, yeah. And we know from this property that the variance of x bar two is, is this, right? Okay, so you can write this as Okay, you can write this as this, right? Now the question is asking you to minimize this as a function of a, right? It's sigma squared is a constant. So the only thing that involves a is this guy here. So let me call this a g of a times sigma squared. Now we need to minimize g as a function of a. Now you know from your calculus, the calculus that in order to minimize a function, what you need to do is the following. You need to so our g of a is this one. So you need to first find the derivative with respect to a, so which is gonna be two a divided by n one minus two times one minus a divided by n two, right? This is the derivative and set this to zero, right? Set this to zero. And if you solve this equation for a, you will get the solution to be, you, you will get the solution to be, I don't have the time to solve it, but I will just write down the solution. This is the solution for A of this equation. And if you look at the second order derivative, which is the first order derivative of this, you will get, you will get this, right? Which is positive, right? Now, since the second order, since the second order derivative is positive, this implies that G is minimized, is minimized at A equal to N1 divided by N1 plus N2, right? Right, in other words, now since the variance, remember, since the variance of G times sigma squared, this implies further right, that the variance of mu hat is minimized at a equal to, okay. All right, guys, so that completes, I know I kind of rushed because of the time, but I, that completes question number two of the tutorial sheet. Are you guys okay with this? Uh, I, did you did you follow what I did with this question? Is it? Yeah, it is called optimization. Yeah, it, you are right, Matthew. Yeah. So what I've done is to is to optimize the function g with respect to a, and I found I I, I found out that g attains the minimum value when a is equal to n one divided by n one plus n two. Any questions, guys? Any other questions you have? You okay? All of you sure? 
All right, so that, all right, so I just run out of time. Uh, so I've done question two. Uh, the only question I haven't done is question one. I will, uh, I will, this, this is not a difficult question, but I will post the full solutions to all the eight questions uh, on Thursday of this week. So you will be able to see the full solutions to all of them. So that will include the handwritten solution, the typed solution, and also the video solutions. Okay, guys, so have a great morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you are. And as usual, any questions you guys have, please feel free to contact me 24 seven by email, Skype, Zoom, or phone. My home phone number is 0161-273-2941. Okay, have a great day, guys, and take care.
Hello guys, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. Um, so today, uh, the, the purpose of this session is a tutorial, uh, sheet number eight. Um, <coughs> um, so I'm gonna go through, there are, there, are seven, there are seven questions in this tutorial sheet. I hope you already seen this tutorial sheet. There are seven questions. I will try to do as many of them as I can. And, um, um, and of course, whenever you have any questions, uh, please feel free to use the chat room, right? So I will start with, I will start with question number seven first. Right? So this is uh, question number seven is about an engineering firm that comp that manufactures a component, and it says that the the component has a has a non-standard deviation lifetime of three point four hours, and it also says that you're picking nine components at random, 
and the average lifetime, the average lifetime is 100.8, right? And the question is to find the 95% and the 98% confidence intervals for the, for the mean component lifetime, right? Now, uh, uh, I don't know whether you, whether you guys looked at the review session yesterday. In the review session, I gave you uh, several different confidence intervals, right? The one that you need to use for this example, for this question, is the one where we're gonna assume that the population standard deviation or the population variance is known. Because the question says here, as you can see, the question says you have a non-standard deviation of 3.4 hours, which means that you're assuming that, that the population standard deviation or the population variance is known, right? Okay, so in order to do this question, so let's start with question seven. In order to do this question, I'm gonna use this formula here. This is one of the formulas I gave you yesterday. You remember this formula guys or not? This is a formula I gave you yesterday in the review session, right? Okay. Now we are told that sigma, sigma is the population standard deviation is 3.4. And we are told that N is a sample size, which is nine. And we are told that X bar, X bar is the sample mean is equal to 100.8, okay? All right, so we got everything that we need. And now we are looking for 95% and 98% confidence intervals. So for, let's first look at 95%. So it means that 100 times one month's alpha is, is 95, okay? So this implies that one minus alpha is 0 0.95. And this implies that alpha is 0 0.05, okay? Yes, yes, you can, Mikhail. Yeah, you can use the, the, the confidence intervals that I gave you directly, yeah. But you have to be careful about which one you choose. I mean, depending on the questioning of, depending on the wording of the question, uh, you should choose one of the four that I gave you yesterday. Right. You don't need to prove it unless unless the question asking you to prove it, then you should prove it. But in this for this kind of questions, you can use it directly without proving the confidence interval. In it depends on the exam question, Mikhail. I mean, it depends on what the question is asking you. Sometimes the question will ask you to derive it before you're using it. All right. So like in this question, it, the question is not asking you to derive the confidence interval, just to use it, right? So, so it's okay to use it without deriving it. But if the question is asking you to derive the confidence interval first, then you should do so, right? And then use it. Is that, is that clear, Mikhail? Okay, so, so this is, this is the, the percentile of the standard normal, which you can read from the normal table. Uh, uh, in, in the video, one of the videos yesterday, I showed you how to read the table, right? Um, so if you haven't read the, if you haven't watched the video, please, please watch again, right? Okay. All right, now using this, um, using this formula, you can get 100.8, plus or minus 1.96 times 3.4 divided by square root of nine. And if you work this out, the 95% the confidence interval is from 98.58 to 103.02. All right, so this is the 98% confidence interval, sorry, 95% confidence interval for the mean lifetime. 
Right, part two. Part two is asking you for the 98 percent. So 100 times one minus alpha is is 98. Yeah. And so that implies that one minus alpha is 0 0.98. And this implies that alpha is 0 0.02. And this implies that Z one minus alpha by two is 0 0.99. And if you read this off the table, uh, if you read this off the normal table, you will get this to be 2.326, right? And hence, using one uh, Just, just a minute, guys. Okay, can you can you see it again? Sorry. Sorry, I, I'm I'm sorry that. I'm sorry there are, there have been an issue with the. There was there was an issue with the camera. I don't know. Okay, sorry, guys. So, all right, now back to back to question seven again. Um, now, if you use this formula one more time, you get x bar, which is 100.8 uh, plus, plus or minus um, 2.326 times 3.4 divided by the square root of 9. Now, if you simplify this, guys, you will get the 98% confidence interval to be, to be this. OK? All right, so this completes, uh, I'm sorry for the trouble one more time, but this is this completes question number seven, All right? So this is the, the 95% confidence interval for the mean lifetime, and this is the 98% confidence interval for the mean lifetime. All right, any, are you guys okay with this? Any questions? Are you, are you all, are you able to follow this okay so far? Hello guys, talk to me, please. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, now, the next question, so I'm done with question seven. The next question, I'm gonna look at question six here. Question six is about a concentration in a fish caught in Lake Michigan. Um, and it says that it has a standard deviation of 0 0.8 parts per million. And you have a sample of size 10. And these are the data points on the concentration level. And the question is to find the 95% and the 99% confidence interval for the concentration level. Okay. Right. Let's see how we can do this. Um, now, you should read the question carefully. If you read the question carefully, once again, it says that the standard deviation is known to be 0 0.8. So the formula that you need to use is once again, 
the formula that you need to use is the same as the previous. All right, this is once you're gonna use, you're gonna use this formula one more time, okay? So your, your sigma, your sigma, which is the population standard deviation is 0 0.8 and N is 10 X bar. Now X bar is the sample mean. Now you got these 10, 10 data values, right? And what you need to do is you need to take the sum of them and divide by 10. And if you do that, you will get 11.48 11 11 as the X bar. All right now we are asked to find the 95 percent and the 99 percent confidence intervals so let's do with let's start with the 95 percent right this is the this is the 95 percent confidence interval so this implies that one minus alpha is 0 0.95 all right so your alpha is 0 0.05 so your Z one minus alpha by two is, is this, right? Now, if you read this off the table, if you read this off the normal table, this will be equal to 1.96. All right, now using this formula, using this formula, you will get 11.48 plus or minus 1.96 times 0 0.8 divided by the square root of 10. Okay. Now, if you work this out, the lower limit will be 10.99 and the upper limit will be 11.98. So this is the, this is the 95% confidence interval for the mean concentration level. Okay, guys, now part two, in part two, we are looking for the 99% confidence interval. So your 100 times one minus alpha is, is 99. All right, so your one minus alpha is 0 0.99. So your alpha is 0 0.01, right? And, um, And your Z one minus alpha by two will be Z 0 0.995, right? And if you read this off the table, this will be 2.576, right? So, so once again, using this formula here, right at the top, if you use that formula one more time, you will get uh, 11.48 plus or minus 2.576 uh, divided by the square root of 10. All right, so, so the lower limit is 10.83 and the upper limit is 12.13. All right, so this is the, the 99th percent confidence interval for the mean concentration, okay? All right, guys, so this is question number six. Uh, are you okay with this? Anything that not clear, please feel free to talk to me using the chat room. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you use the closed in open interval or the, uh, well, it doesn't matter what kind of interval you, that you use. You can use, you can use the, the round intervals or the square brackets. It either is okay with me, right? So it doesn't really matter which kind of interval you use, okay? All right, any other questions, guys, please let me know. All right, okay, thank you. Um, all right, so we're done with question number six now. The next question I'm going to look at is question five. Question five is on, um, you have a random sample from a geometric distribution. 
the first part is to write down the likelihood and the log likelihood. And the second part is to find the maximum likelihood estimator of P. Okay. I think I did this question earlier, but let me do it again. All right. So this is question five. All right. Now remember the likelihood is the the likelihood is the product of the density function. In this case, the product of in the product of the um, the probability mass function, right? This is the probability mass function of the uh, geometric geometric distribution. I'm sure you know that, right? So this will be right. So this is what you get. Now the product the product of p i from one to n is this. And the product of this guy here is <coughs> is this, yeah. Right. Now this one you can write this as now if you take the sum inside the brackets, right? You will get the sum of uh, the sum of xi, right? and the sum of one, the sum of one is n, <coughs> all right? So this is the likelihood function. All right, the next thing we want is the log of the likelihood function. So the log of this, which is gonna be n times the log of p uh, plus the log of this, which is Right, so this is the log of the likelihood, right? Right, so that's part one. Part two is asking you to find the MLE. <coughs> to find the MLE, the first thing you must do is to find the derivative with respect to P and set it to zero. So the derivative with respect to P is N by P. Uh, derivative of this is, is Okay, so this is the derivative and, and you set this to zero and solve for type solve for P, right? So this becomes Okay, this becomes this, yeah. Now, if you, if you do the cross multiplication, you will get n times one minus p, which is n minus np equal to p times minus np, right? Now, these two guys cancel out. So, so you get the solution for p, let me call it p hat to be equal to n divided by the sum of xi. What, or this is, you can write this as one divided by x bar, where x bar is the sample mean, right? All right, now in order to show that this is a maximum likelihood estimator, we need to take the second order derivative with respect to P and show that is negative, all right? So let me let me show you that now, all right? Okay, so, 
So I'm going to take the second order derivative with respect to P. Yeah, so which is the first, first order derivative of this. So this is going to be Right. Now we need to show that this is negative. Now clearly the first term, the first term is negative, and the second term is also negative. But we need to be careful about the sign of this. So we need to investigate what what values this can take. Right. In order to see, in order to see that. Look that xi, xi by definition, it, because it's a geometric random variable, uh, it must be greater than or equal to one for every i. Okay, all right, guys. And this implies that, that the sum of xi. Is greater than or equal to the sum of sum of one, right? Okay, and this implies that the sum of xi is greater than or equal to the sum of one is n, right? And this implies that the sum of xi minus n must be non-negative, right? So, so what I have shown is that this guy here is non-negative, and this is also positive, and this you have a negative sign in front here. So, hence, hence I have shown that this guy is less than zero. Okay, so hence the conclusion is that the conclusion is that since the second order derivative is negative, we can say that this. All right, guys. Uh, so this completes question number four. Are you, are you guys okay with this? Are you any questions? Please let me know. Please use the chat room. Okay. Thank you. Are you all okay? Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. So the next question I'm going to do. So we're done with question number four. Um, Sorry, question number five, I said. This is question five that I just finished. Okay, the next question I'm gonna do is question number four. So here we have uh, five uh, random numbers of five variables from a binomial distribution with parameters three and P. The first part is to write down the likelihood function, right? I'm sure you know how to do that. So um, let me show you. Yeah, when, yeah, if it is not smaller than zero, Vincent, then you cannot say that it's an MLE. If it, so it has to be, it has to be smaller than zero for, for, an, for an estimator to be a maximum likelihood estimator. Right. Okay, Vincent. Uh, yeah. Um, all right. So let's start with question number four. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is to write down the the likelihood function, right? Uh, so the likelihood is going to be the product uh, i from one to five of the density of the binomial, right? Now that's going to be three choose x i. Okay, so this is the density of the binomial with parameters three and p, right? 
Now there are three terms. So, so basically you need to take the product for each of the three terms. Okay. All right. Now let's see how we can simplify this. All right. The first term you cannot simplify further. So you have to write it like you have to write it like this. The second term you can simplify it as P power the sum of XI. Okay, and the third term you can simplify as one minus p power the sum of three minus xi. Okay, so this this becomes Okay, this is the first term. The second term is um, this. And the third term is, now if you take the sum inside the brackets, you get 15 minus the sum of, um, sum of xi. Right, so this, so this is the, the simplified form of the likelihood function. Are you guys okay with this? Yeah, let me know if you have questions, please, please feel free. Uh, please feel free to, to ask any questions you guys have, okay? Yeah, right. Now the second part, in the second part, you are actually given the values for the axis, you are told uh, you're told that x1 is equal to 1, x2 is equal to 3, uh, x3 is equal to 2, x4 is equal to 2, and x5 is equal to 3. So you, you are given these values, right? So, so the likelihood function L of P right uh, if you sub these values into this right you will get um the following you will get three choose one uh, three choose three uh, three choose two three choose two three choose three now p the sum of xi the, is just the sum of these numbers so it's one plus three plus two plus two plus three which is uh, 11, one minus P power 15 minus 11, all right? Okay, guys, so this, uh, you should have a calculator. You can simplify this to 27 P power 11, one minus P power four. So this is the likelihood function for, for these data values here, right? Right, now you are also told in part two of question four that, that the values that P can take are, are one of the following. All right, so it's 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 or 0 0.8, right? So when P is, so what I'm gonna do now is um, for each of these P values, I'm gonna compute the likelihood function. So when P is 0 0.5, the likelihood, if you sub it here, you will get 
L of P to be 8.24 times 10 to the power minus four. When P is 0 0.6, you get 2.51 times 10 to the power minus three. When P is 0 0.7, you get 4.32 times 10 to the power minus three. And when P is 0 0.8, you get 3.71 times 10 to the power minus three. Now remember maximum likelihood estimation is basically, it says that the, the maximum likelihood estimator is the value for the parameter when the likelihood is largest. Now, if you look over here, guys, the largest value of the likelihood is this one. This is the largest of the, of the four numbers, right? Okay, so the so the maximum. Oh, you've got a problem with the camera. Oh, come on, guys. Is it okay now or no? Can it's blurred? Is it? I don't know but why you keep doing this. Is it? Is it okay now? Is it better now or no? Hello guys, is it better now? Thank you. I, I don't know why you keep doing this, but this is the best quality I can buy. I get no money from this, from the uni. All right, so this is the largest of the likelihood values. So, so, so the MLE, so the MLE of P is 0. 0 0.7, okay, because it, that 0 0.7 corresponds to the largest likelihood value. All right, guys, so this completes question number four of the tutorial sheet. Uh, are you guys okay with this? Any Anything that you want to ask me on this question before I go to the next one? Okay, and um, please let me know. I mean, if, if the if the if you can't see the camera well, please let me know. Once again, I will try to fix. I, I don't know. I mean, if 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 the camera is still giving you problems, please let me know, guys. Okay. Uh, but as I said, this is the best quality I can get. Okay, so. So I just finished doing question four. The next question I'm gonna do is question number three, right? It's this one. Um, now you have a random sample from this density function where delta is unknown. And the first part is to show that X bar is a biased estimate of delta, right? Okay, um, let's see how we can do that. This is question number three. So please let me know if, if, if the camera is still not working, please let me know. So, so you have X bar is, a, is, is an estimator of delta, okay? Now we need to show that this is biased. Remember an, a biased estimator is, is an estimator where where the bias is not equal to zero, right? So basically we need to show that the bias of this estimator is different from zero, all right? Now remember the bias is defined as the expectation of X bar minus the parameter that you're trying to estimate, which is delta here. So this is the expectation of one over N times the sum of XI minus delta, right? Now, if you take the expectation inside, you get one over N minus delta, right? Now, to find the expectation of the variable Xi, you just need to integrate the density function here, right? So that's what I'm going to do now. So, 
So it's going to be one over M times the integral from Delta to infinity of X E minus X plus Delta DX minus Delta. All right now, this is a constant, so you can pull it outside. So this becomes All right, this becomes this, all right. Now the integral of this, I mean, the best way to do this integration, I'm sure you've done more calculus than I have, uh, is to use integration by parts. So I'm gonna use integration by parts in the, in the next step. All right, so if you do that, you get X See, I'm, I just done. So this is basically integration by parts, right? So this becomes all right. Now the limit at infinity is is zero, and the limit at delta is is this right? Now the integral of this guy is. is this, right? And then you take the limit from delta to infinity. Okay. All right, now you get E. I know it looks kind of complicated, but it's not. I mean, if you, uh, if you do it faster, I mean, minus minus gives you delta E minus delta. The limit at infinity is, is once again zero. And the limited delta is minus, so it becomes actually plus because of the minus minus. Okay, right now I'm going to multiply. There's this term here outside, so I'm going to bring this inside, inside the brackets, and multiply across. So this will become one over n. delta plus one. Do, do you see how I got delta plus one? Because I multiplied this by e, by this term and this by this term. So you get delta plus one, right? Now delta plus one is a constant with respect to i. So this is gonna be n times delta plus one. Yeah the N and the N cancels. So this becomes Delta plus one minus Delta, right? Which is, which is equal to one, okay? All right, so we have shown, we, so what we have shown guys is that X bar is a biased estimate of delta, right? Because the bias, remember the bias, if it is not equal to zero, then it's a biased estimator. If it is equal to zero, then it's an unbiased estimator, right? All right, guys, are you okay with this so far? Guys, please. Hello, guys, talk to me. Are you, are you okay with this so far with the part one? This is part one of question three, okay? Now, to do part two, yeah, so part two is asking you to, 
to give the expression for bias, which we have already worked out to be one, right? And it's also asking you what happens to the bias. It's asking you what happens to the bias as n goes to infinity. Because one is a constant, right? The limit is also the same, right? So the limit of the bias is equal to one, right? So that's part two of question three. Part three, part three is asking you to find an unbiased estimator for delta. Now, if you look back at part one, what we have shown here is that the bias of X bar is equal to one. So to make this into a zero, what you need to do is to take away one on, on each side. So if you take away one here, and take away one here, you will get zero, all right? So, so what I'm gonna do is the following. So I'm gonna define, I'm gonna define a new estimator. Okay, and I'm gonna call that delta hat to be equal to X bar minus one, right? And then the bias of this new estimator going to be this, right? And this is going to be the expectation of x bar minus one minus delta. Now from the first part, which I just showed you, right from the first part, the expectation of x bar is delta plus one. So this is zero, right? So hence we have shown, so what we have shown is that delta hat is an unbiased estimator. of delta, right? Remember, an unbiased estimator is an estimator for which the bias is equal to zero. All right, guys, so this completes question number, number three. Um, anything you want to ask me, please let me know, guys, okay? All right, now let's go, let's go to back to the tutorial sheet. Um, so I just finished question number three. The next one is question number two. Right here, we have two sample means x bar one and x bar two. They are from a normal distribution with sample sizes n1 and n2 respectively. And then you have this estimator, right? For mu. And the first part is to show that the bias of this estimator is zero. Now, that's not really difficult. So let me show you. So this is question number two. So you have two different estimators. So you have the two different sample means. X bar one is the sample mean of a sample of size N1 from, from this distribution. So from one of the properties I taught you in the in the video on the normal distribution, you will see this. I mean, I don't know if you don't remember this, please go back and look at the video I did for you guys. So these are two properties. I mean, these are properties I talked about uh, earlier on in this course, right? So that the sample mean must have this distribution and this must have this distribution. So if you're looking at the bias, if you're looking at the bias of mu hat, where mu hat is given by this. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm gonna compute, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use these two results to compute the expectation. All right, now you can take the expectation inside like this. Now the expectation of, of this is, we know that X bar one has this distribution. 
So the expectation, oh, is it camera again blurring? Sorry guys, I don't know why this keep happening. Just let me, let me try to fix it. Just a minute, give me a sec. Is it, is it okay now or is it better? Hello guys, is it better now or is it still blurring? Okay, thank you. Um, I really don't know. Anyway, anyway, so this is the expected value of x bar one using this result is a times mu. And the expected value of x bar two using this result is one minus a times mu. Yeah. Now, obviously this, this guy here is equal to zero. So, so, so what we have shown is that mu hat is unbiased for, for mu, right? Okay. So this is only the first part of question two. Now to do the second part of question two, uh, it's asking you to find the variance of the estimator and show that is minimized when A is equal to N1 divided by N1 plus N2, right? So that's not, that's really not difficult because what you, once again, once again to, to find the variance of the estimator you need to use these two properties, right? All right, that the x bar one has this distribution and x bar two has this distribution, right? And then try to try to minimize using standard calculus, right? Okay. Uh, so I just got, okay, I'll just write it down the first few steps so you can see it. Uh, so to find the variance, I won't be able to complete it because I'm running out of time, guys. Um, this is the variance, right? Now, if you take the variance inside, A becomes A squared. Yeah. Um, and this is a squared times the variance of x bar one using this property here is sigma squared divided by n1. And similarly, the variance of x bar two is sigma squared divided by n2. Okay. All right now you can write this as a squared divided by n1 plus one minus a squared divided by n2 uh, times sigma squared outside. All right, now what you need to do, I have run out of time already. What you need to do is to try to minimize this as a function of a. So to do that, you just simply differentiate this with respect to a, set it to zero, and then show that the solution is uh, is n1 divided by n1 plus n2, and it corresponds to a minimum, right? Um, that I don't have the time to do that, but you will. I will post the full solutions to all eight questions uh, day after tomorrow on Thursday, so you you'll be able to see the full solutions uh, in typed form, in handwritten form, and also in in a video form, right? So uh, I will do that Thursday afternoon, all right? In the meantime, if you have any questions about the course as usual, please feel free to contact me 24 seven, all right, by email, Skype, Zoom, or phone. All right, my home phone, home, my home phone number is 0161-273-2941. All right, guys, have a good, afternoon, a good morning, a good evening, wherever you are, and please take care of yourself. So please, any questions you have about the course, please feel free to contact me 24-7. I mean, I'm here to help you guys, as always. Okay. Take care, guys. <laughs>